we struggled to figure out a family song because we've already kind of done the three, this, those other three. So I felt like, well, Timothy suggested it first, and I sent it to Jalen, but for some reason he didn't want to do it. Baby shark, do, 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 baby shark, do, do. I thought that would be good. Mommy shark, do, 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 do. Mommy shark, do. Oh, he went up a key. Mommy shark. Do I, I don't get any kids involved in this now. Okay. Oh, well, there. He even practiced it. Look, <laughs> he was ready. All right, so we won't do that for this evening, but um, we just thought it would be kind of fun to have sort of a family-friendly song starting out. You guys were kind of awkward with it, but it's okay. Everybody who watches it in the future will think it's cute, so that's all. Wow, y'all going to wake up? <sighs> anyway, Sister Hemus did text me. They went to the East Coast. They went, they flew into Orlando, made it just before the, the uh, airport closed, and they thought they'd be safe on the east coast of Florida, and then it got hammered today. So, yes, they are hunkered down, hoping that it doesn't get any worse, and I think it's, well, it may have already blown off of the east coast. So, yeah, and then it's supposed to get some more vengeance and hit the coast again. So we're now praying for South Carolina, in Jesus' name, so... Um, anyway, in, in all, um, just not being funny at all seriousness, we do need to pray. We have saints, we have churches, we, I just, everybody, the folks that have lost the devastation in Fort Myers beach, et cetera, it's insane, the devastation. So we want to pray for all those folks. Timothy has a friend whose family pastors in Fort Myers beach, and he has to, yet to find out how much they've lost and. So, uh, you know, it's it's bad. So we want to pray for those folks for sure. Um, and it's crazy how it cut across Florida, right through, through Orlando, where the UPCI General Conference is going to be held for the first time in Orlando, Florida, next week. Huh. So I don't know. But if I were the bishop, I would say something like, somebody is not happy about the saints of the Most High gathering together in one location. 14,000 of them evidently are registered to attend that conference next week. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking that, you know. Anyway, I'm going to talk about the family. If we can delete all that, Jalen. <laughs> My quick recap um, of the last few weeks, because I know it's hard to keep track sometimes, but we learned about different types and structures of families, the definition of a nuclear family. Again, two married parents of opposite genders and their biological, with their biological or adopted children living in the same residence. The family was established from the very beginning, even before the church. Therefore, strong families create strong churches. The Christian family, the Christian marriage and family is so important because it is a living, breathing example of Christ's relationship with the church and therefore propagates the gospel. Characteristics of a godly home, we talked about those. We went through 1 Corinthians 13 and specifically detailed that with regards to the home. And then our last session was kind of nuts and bolts, really simple. Hopefully it didn't lose... Um, too many of you in its simplicity because it actually is very powerful simplicity and that was learning the roles of family members and that is with regards to honoring one another so anybody want to tell me what the definition of, an, of honor is that we learned two weeks ago anybody remember it oh isaac Very nice. Good job, Isaac. Woo! All right. And on top of that, we're also going to treat people as special. We're going to do more than what's expected. And we're going to have a good attitude. Right, guys? You're in that seat again? You're both? Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, Tommy. All right. Hot seat. 
All right. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we learned about honoring one another in family life. We talked about parental responsibilities um, and using tools such as reverse planning, ways to train up our children at a young age so that they develop a lifestyle of holiness and godly character. So tonight is going to be pretty heavy, in my opinion, um, as if it hasn't been heavy enough. There has been some feedback here and there. Now, I have, we haven't gotten a whole lot of feedback. I actually would love some feedback. Um, so feel free to text or email that to us. We have received some negative feedback, but here's what I mean by that. In the form of some folks that have really struggled with feeling like when they f hear these ideals about what a family could be like or is like or should be like, they feel a lot of grief come across them, like what they didn't have or what they didn't experience growing up or and or a parent who maybe didn't do as good of a job as they felt like they should have and they're learning things now in retrospect, et cetera. So I understand that. We have been trying to be very gracious about all of that. Um, tonight could be that like that again, <laughs> but maybe magnified a little bit. Um, and I have felt personally battled all day over this subject matter. Um, I feel like mm, the enemy does not want this message broadcast tonight. I'm just telling you that. I just know that in my spirit. I have felt so battled. I've had so much chaos in my mind today. I've had to, like, every 30 minutes stop and go, I got to bring it into captivity. I refuse to give into this feeling of watering down what a Christian family should be like. I just feel like the world is in our face with their agenda. And I am sorry, but the church has got to stand firm on what we believe with regards to the family. I, I just, you know, I was challenged recently. I saw the, um, I don't, what is the head of Italy called? A president? What, the prime minister? Did anybody see the prime minister of Italy standing up for the family? Oh, my word. Look it up on YouTube. Absolutely incredible, incredible stand about family. I, I, and I just, I saw that just a couple days ago, and I thought, okay. That's it. <laughs> if she can do that, <laughs> you know, on a worldwide platform and make that kind of stand as a politician, oh my word. Are you kidding me? We are children of truth, of God, <laughs> of all that is right and good. <laughs> That's who we are. And we are going to proclaim what a Christian family should be like. So, we're going to talk about the importance of the spiritual leader of the home, specifically the male head of the home. So, some of you men are going to be uncomfortable because you're going to be a little bit, you're, you're either going to be convicted <laughs> or you're going to be converted, and or, or you're going to be um, what's the other word I'm trying to think anyway, hopefully all of those things. But uh, what was the, uh, the other word I'm trying to think? I don't want you to beat yourself up. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't want you to take this on and be like, oh, my word, the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. I'm just I know we've said that over and over, but I don't want the men to go down that rabbit trail because the enemy likes us to go down those rabbit trails because if he can keep you in the past, you're not going to move forward and you're not going to get better and you're not going to change. And so you're going to keep doing what you've always done if you live in the past and all your shoulda, coulda, woulda. So I'm just I'm making that statement now. I don't want anybody to feel like um, we're attacking you. So but we are going to very strongly talk about the male head of the house. Um, now, there's going to be a handful of people 
here tonight and even watching in the future that you there's not a male he head of your house. So what I want you to do is just try to listen to the principles being set forth. If that is not the case for you and you don't have a male head of your home, think about the principles. If you, in fact, are a female and you are the head of that home, um, but I do urge you, even a female head of a home, I do urge you to have a male authority, a godly Christian male authority that you consider as a covering to help you and protect you. A covering protects us. All right, everybody? It's like an umbrella in a storm. All right? It protects us. So I really encourage you. Um, if you're not a male head of a home, that you at least still have someone else as a higher um, over you as a protection. But listen to the principles and figure out how that applies to your home. But we are going to specifically deal with husbands, fathers, um, the male heads of the house. All right, and then we kind of have a treat towards the end, and we're going to be playing something, a video, and you're going to hear some firsthand testimony about what it also means for a father to then become the patriarch in the family, um, to take on that role. The patriarch in a family would be the father of like the tribe, of the whole family, um, not just those in the home, but it's once the children leave home, then the patriarch sort of you become sort of the patriarch, okay? So you're going to kind of hear some testimony about what that looks like. The enemy of our soul, it's the enemy of our families. Um, he is set out to undermine the leadership and authority of the men in our homes, of men in general. Disney has seen to it to officially emasculate the men. <laughs> Nickelodeon, you name it, all the shows, that's their, that's their agenda. They have seen to, it, seen to it to make the fathers and the male role models in these movies and shows, cartoons, to be pansies, to be pushovers. Um, it, it, it just, it, without fail, it's all, you know, dad doesn't understand me. Uh, it's, it's always that. Have you ever seen that? You know, it's all wrapped in this other package of a child who needs understanding. But it's always, Dad doesn't understand that. I always joked about the high school musical reference. Dad doesn't understand that I don't want to just be a basketball player. I want to be a singer and dancer, too. Come on. You know, so the whole film is about... Dad who doesn't understand me, and I'm going to show him and prove to him that I want to be a singer, too. You know, it's all over those shows. It's what young people are being inundated with. So many of the brunt of the jokes and the sarcasm disrespect men. Being the head of your house, however, just to be clear, does not mean that you control everybody. Okay. It doesn't mean that you manipulate the people in your home. It doesn't mean that you exhibit some sort of warped, apostolic version of narcissism. Because that's disguised as apostolic authority. Nope. Doesn't mean any of those things. It doesn't mean that the people in your home are subject to you. That they live in fear of what dad or husband might do, okay? That's not what this means, all right? So I want you to keep that in mind as we go along here. The head of the house should be setting the climate in the home. The, the spiritual head of a home needs to be setting the climate. The male head should be setting the thermostat according to what you want it to be like. If there's confusion and chaos, then men, you might need to go to prayer and you might need to figure out what this spirit of confusion and chaos is. It, whatever this means, if there's rebellion, that doesn't mean we attack our children. That means we pray about how to help our children get the rebellion out of their heart. 
All right, so you see the difference? This isn't control. Ephesians 5 and 24, I, I actually copied and pasted this, and then, oh, long story, I don't know what article this is from. Y'all, no surprise. Um, some of this was me, and some of this is from article, and I can't remember which now. Um, Ephesians 5 and 24, we've already read this, um, but I'm going to just read to you a couple of things. This principle that is instructed to married men, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. If you want a biblical marriage, then you need to understand how Christ, quote unquote, Christ loved the church. Some think Christ is Jesus's last name. Nope. It's a title. It means Messiah. It means anointed one. Jesus loved the church, his family, as it's Christ, the anointed one. Husbands should love their wives in the same way as the anointed one loved his family, loves his family. They need to know exactly what Jesus was anointed to do. In the New Testament, husbands become the anointed ones. All right, Christ occupies, oops, no, go away. Christ occupies a threefold office, and that is prophet, priest, and king. All right, let's explore how this relates to you men. The role of a prophet. A prophet represents God to the people. In the Old Testament, a prophet would face the people and speak. Jesus was a prophet who spoke, sorry, um, the word of God to the people and was, in fact, the word incarnate. A prophet speaks for God. A husband should be the family prophet. He represents God to his wife and, by extension, his family, the fruit of their union. When his wife reacts emotionally, he calms her with his wisdom. He proclaims the gospel of faith to his family. He provides biblical instruction and training to his wife and children. He prepares family devotions, encourages private devotions. He's the arbiter of family values. He insists on regular church attendance. He is a messenger from God to his family. My, my, my. The role of a priest. I really want you young men listening to this. Tommy, you listening to this, right? This is good stuff. You're about to get married in January. You got to listen to this stuff. This is good stuff. This is going to change your life. It's going to give you the most amazing marriage because it's going to be built on such a strong foundation. No, I'm looking at Stephen right here. You guys, sorry, Stephen's right behind him. I looked at Tommy and said all that, and then I looked at Stephen and I said, you're getting married in January. They missed all that. They thought Tommy, hey, you getting married in January? Was I just a prophet? He is so bright red right now. I love it. That's true. We got to find a girl first. All right, so. <laughs> All right, sorry, Tommy, I'm embarrassed for you, goodness. Stephen's the one get married in January. Okay. Young men, oh, yes, everybody understands now. Um, so, goodness, y'all can't do this to me. I get distracted. Um, role of the priest. Let's talk about the role of a priest. The young men need to listen because this is good stuff, all right? And what I don't want you to do is sit here and judge, judge, judge your father who might be in church, who might be spiritual and godly, but guess what? Is an imperfect human being, all right? We're all just trying to the best of our ability. And perhaps your father, this could be the first time your father is hearing this tonight. So your father may not have known how to do all this, all right? So we're going to exhibit a lot of grace. We're going to look back with mercy, all those things, right? But just because we don't have a great father doesn't mean you can't be a great man, all right? You can do this. The role of a priest. 
If a prophet represents God to people, then the priest is representing the people to God. In the Old Testament, a priest would turn his back to the people and mediate for them before God. Jesus, however, became the high priest who mediated between the people and God by the sacrifice of his life. A priest mediates before God. A husband, father, is to be the family priest. He represents his wife and children to God. He spends time in prayer each day remembering the needs and concerns of his wife and children. He prays for the salvation of his children. Like Job, he asks the Lord to forgive the sins of his children. He sets the spiritual temperature in the home. He sacrifices his life for theirs. He is a mediator to God for his family. So good. All right, role of the king, not King Charles, and not the, a dictator king. That's not what we're talking about. When we explain to you what a king really does here, you might do a big gulp. Not from 7-Eleven. A king takes responsibility <coughs> for the welfare of his people. The king takes responsibility for the welfare of his people. He provides both justice and mercy to his people. Jesus is our king from the line of David. A king provides for and offers protection and security for his people. The husband or father is to be the family king. He provides for the needs of his family. He works diligently to earn enough for food and shelter. He administers discipline with fairness. He quickly forgives and overlooks offenses. He acts in a manner worthy of receiving honor. He acts in a manner worthy of receiving honor. He treats his wife with consideration and respect. He is careful not to be harsh. He is a provider for his family. Now, I might just have a little sidebar that doesn't let the women off the hook in case the women are in here going, yeah, you tell those men how they're supposed to act. Well, that's my sidebar right there. If that's your attitude, there's a problem. Because women need to respect men, plain and simple. I'm just going to put that out there. Women need to respect men. Yes. Now, women who are all like, well, chivalry is dead. Well, you know what? There's so much of this feministic culture, and, like, I don't need a man. Why? So then men don't open doors for women anymore because women don't need men. None of it makes an ounce of sense. Like, think about it. It just doesn't make any sense. So that's our culture. But that we're, we don't live in that culture. That's not our culture. All right? This is a biblical culture. All right? And women should respect men. The women in the house need to respect the father and the husband, especially that father and that husband before the children. The women need to be respecting the father. You need to teach your children and by example how to respect their father. So the women are not off the hook, all right? This goes for ladies young and old, respecting men young and old. What I want to, in closing, deal with the attack of authority that's happening on the men in a family, the attack on authority. The spirit, I'm, listen to me closely, the spirit behind this culture, and it's not new. Same-sex relationships have been around for years. It's been around since Bible times, for that matter. The spirit behind that, a same-sex relationship, has an agenda. And if you're not careful, you're not realizing what that agenda is. And here's something I want to drop in your spirit. Part of that agenda involves eliminating procreation. Like I mentioned in San Francisco, the neighborhoods that don't have playgrounds. 
neighborhoods with same-sex relationships, why do we need playgrounds? There's no offspring of our relationship. Now, mind you, the world is coming up with all kinds of ways to undermine even that. And so, of course, now same-sex you know, relationships can adopt children, et cetera. But we're, we're, not, we're not talking about all the crazy exceptions that are happening. We're talking about the principle here. The spirit wishes to eliminate procreation, or let's look at it this way, eliminate reproduction. Let's think about this. If you have the ability to reproduce you should be reproducing, okay? This is actually emasculating to men, but more specifically, it's also undermining male authority. It undermines who a man is to take away the ability to reproduce. It's eliminating the ability to reproduce the nuclear family. So, that, so hear me, I'm not just talking about reproduction. I'm talking about the reproduction of the nuclear family. It's taking away the ability to reproduce a nuclear family, even the relationships where they're adopting children. That is not a reproduction of another nuclear family. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, somebody's clapping, thank you. I, I'm telling you, man, I was feeling this intense. I, the devil does not want this said. If the devil can break down all of this, just I don't know, this just dropped in my spirit. If the devil can break down the nuclear family, there is no more example of spiritual headship in a home. Okay? There's no more example of it. That's a limit. Spiritual headship. Let's go back to Christ loving. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church for this cause. It's eliminating Christ's authority. It's exactly what's happening, which means if there's no more example of Christ's authority, there's no more example of Christ's great power over sin. There's no more. See, it's a domino effect what's happening here, folks. That is eliminating the example of Christ's great love for us. Let's think about this. Christ's great love. What does the devil want the most for people to not understand how much God loves them? The end game would be no more reproductions of Jesus Christ in this world. No more reproductions of him. That's ultimately what he's wanting, is that we don't reproduce Jesus Christ in this world. And, you you know, I don't know about you, but we're actually like all little Jesuses running around here on this earth. I mean, come on. We have flesh on our body, and we have the Spirit of God living inside of us. That's pretty much as like Jesus as I can get. I mean with a whole lot of character, other qualities that we need to be like. But in the, in the physical sense of the word, we're little Jesuses. And guess what? We're supposed to reproduce a whole, mo a whole lot more little Jesuses. I don't know why I'm saying little. It's like I just feel little compared to God. So I just, I feel like he's just looking at earth and like all the little Jesuses running around on the earth. I don't know. That's just my crazy brain. But think about it. Think about what the family is supposed to be reproducing. There's so much more to this than meets the eye. If you really want to understand the importance of the Christian family, you've got to truly understand the importance of a Christian man, a godly, spiritual man leading our homes. It's critical. The more you understand it, ladies, the more respect you have. And even if your husband is not, quote, unquote, respectable, guess what? We're still going to respect because <laughs> it's the right thing to do. But 
you've got to understand the importance of having godly spiritual headship in our homes because that means it's men who are loving their families as Christ loved the church. And that is all I have to say, but for this cause. <laughs> that's why the importance of family, that's why the family is so important. There we go. Pastor. So I'm going to get all my apologizing out of the way now, okay? Um, again, we both tried to be extremely mindful that this is a very broad audience. This is, as we've said from the beginning, it's not a marriage seminar, it's not a parenting seminar, but obviously if you're going to talk about the family, those are some of the key elements. And I think one of the, one of the burdens of this um, and part of the grow process is as more come in to hopefully challenge and encourage. Uh, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on a couple of things here, and, and I was thinking about this today. It's sad how, and, and I know I'm not the only one, but I'll just speak for myself. It's, it's sad how intimidated I, I at times let the spirit of this world be because the world does not coat its message. It is in your face. And, and uh, why we feel like we have to do that, it's just it's a tactic of the enemy. So, um, yeah, if you can, I think I have uh, my settings correct, I think. So um, if you could switch my iPad on. Oh, I got to do one more thing, sorry. There we go. Perfect. It, it is said that communication is the key. You know, I've heard it's communication is the key to marriage. Well, the bottom line is it's also said and it's true. Communication is the key to any relationship. Any relationship. And, and you know, one of the, especially when it comes to Maryland, Maryland, to marriage, sorry, I, it's... Uh, 12.15 for me, 12.45. Um, uh, when it comes to um, marriage, one of the, I think, one of the challenges of, a, of, one of the healthy challenges is learning because I believe in a God-ordained marriage, you should have one person that's quiet and one person that's more talkative. And the talkative person wants the quiet person to be talkative, and sometimes the quiet person wants the talkative person to be quiet, but a lot of times as the quiet person, I'm good with somebody else talking. Just don't make me talk. So learning, learning that. So I'm, I'm here, this is going to be a broader sense, and uh, I, I'm going I'm to throw some things out here in the next few moments. It was said, I think my wife said it the very first week, none of this is intended for you to go home or to use at some point as a weapon. And uh, if you do that, you're, you're missing the point and you're misusing what we're trying to do. That being said, I am going to say some things pretty plainly tonight as well that may put a few of you in a place of being uncomfortable with. And I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry because I think if you're uncomfortable with it, it probably means because you're not doing it and you got to make up your mind. Are you going to make some changes or are you just going to keep going on the path you're going. So c communication is huge. Communication, one of the basic definitions is it's the imparting or exchanging of information or news. The imparting or exchanging of information or news. I just threw a couple of things up there for fun, but I really like that one in the middle. Just because you are right does not mean I am wrong. You just haven't seen life from my side. One says it's a six, the other says it's a nine. It's not really where I'm going with this communication thing, but I think it's a point that all of us kind of tagging off of something my wife said, just because you're the dad, just because you're the mom, just because you're the husband, just because you're the wife doesn't make you right. 
as Emerson Egerich says in the Love and Respect series, it's not wrong, it's just different. So, there has never been a day in which communication in a home, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to use that term at least for now, and you define that again based on what your circumstances are, nuclear family, single family, single person, whatever. But if you're living in a, in, a, in a home with more than one person, if you're in a family, there has never been a day where communication has been easier to make sure you have. If your family doesn't have a family chat, that's your homework tonight. I'm still holding on a couple of old chats. I'm in denial, but... Timothy's the one that's named our final four. That's the March Madness logo there. There's never been a day in which communication is easier. If your family is not in the loop with what's going on that day, there's no excuse. Now, hopefully you don't have somebody in your home that makes the bubble green. I mean, if most of you have a blue bubble and somebody makes it green, Lord have mercy. I know some of you have to deal with that trial. I, I feel sorry for you. As everybody knows at this church, we're trying to be apostolics. Wah, wah, wah. But I, I got to tell you, and I, I'm going to... I'm going to be heavier my part in a different way. <laughs> There's just some things that ought not to be so. Parents not knowing what's going on in their kids' day. Kids not knowing what's going on in their parents' day. I mean, a day. I mean, a, a, an actual day. Not knowing if we're eating dinner together or not eating dinner together. Ought, ought not to be so. Your home is not to be a place where ships just pass in the night. Whether that's husband, wife, parents, and kids. It's not what it's, that's not what it is. Because the bottom line is, and again, I, I, I told you I was going to get my apologizing out of the way. You know me. I can't help myself. I'm trying. Sister Tyler, if you're here or watching, I'm trying. I'm still trying. So to those of you that are in different dynamics, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be insensitive of you. And I'm doing all my apologizing and now forgetting why I was apologizing. But we, we live in a day and time in which it's, it's not hard if it's your priority. If it's your priority. I learned something a long time ago after being involved in ministry for several years, I learned something. People have time and money for the things they want time and money for. Now, when it comes to money, I'm not saying you necessarily have enough money for everything, but, but I've watched many times, especially back in my years of being principal of Antioch Christian School, I would watch numerous times when we'd get calls and, you know, Brother Wright, I'm really sorry, but we just can't afford tuition this month. Is there any way you can give us a break? And yeah, sure, we'll give you a break. And, and they come driving up in a new car. You have time for what you want time for. You have money for what you want money for. And, and, and so our... Our decisions on what we do and how we live is revealing our priorities. And in, a, in addition to this just basic idea of communication, we're also in a crazier world than we've ever been in before. In the last couple of months between Apostolic Conference and now 
the trip this last week to England, we had layover in Atlanta. In the Atlanta airport, I, I don't know that I've noticed this in other airports, but in the Atlanta airport, there is a public address announcement that plays every few minutes or so, not every two or three minutes, but I'd say at least every 10 minutes, every 10 minutes or less, there is a public address announcement that makes the point in the airport that we are trying to fight against human trafficking. So if you see anything out of the ordinary going on around you, please report it. I have no desire to inspire fear here tonight. I don't live fearful, but I also live realistic. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge, and I realize this next point for all of you young people and kids at home that have been enjoying your parents getting, uh, being on the hot seat here this evening, now it's your turn. Because I, I, I want to, I, if you've never heard, I, I haven't used this one. I'm just throwing it out there. There's an app called Life 360. Some of the features of it is location safety, driving safety, digital safety, emergency assistance. I think there's a subscription. Anybody use Life 360? Is, it, is there, it's free or is there a subscription also? Or? It's free, but you can pay for more stuff. So there's also a free, for all of you that have the blue bubble, there's a free app. It's called Find My Phone. And I got to tell you, I think every person in a household ought to have Find My Phone or Life 360 as a part of that household. Man, wouldn't, I, there's, there's, it's amazing the different things you'd think you'd get pushback on versus what you'd get pushback on. I don't want nobody to know where I am all the time. Why? The only reason you don't want somebody knowing is because you got something to hide. I don't think my sons-in-law know it yet, and I don't have a problem giving it to them, but the other f five people that have been in my life the longest all know the four-digit code to get into this. Right, my phone. Yeah, it is. But I, I don't have anything to hide. I, I asked her permission to do this, not that it's anything whatever, but I just didn't feel like I should do it without. Sarah Strite moved up here and last fall rented the apartment above our garage for several months. Not a family member, a family member, yes, sorry, she is a family member. <laughs> not, not an immediate family, not one of my kids. I'm jet lag and I'm 50. That's a double dangerous combination. <laughs> not, a, not, a, not one of our offspring. Family, yes, a niece, but not offspring. And, and my wife told her in advance, and she's told several other young ladies, especially if you young young lady that lives alone, you, you, you would be wise to do this. You need to have somebody you're willing to share your location with. You just never know. And she chose us for months, a 20-something-year-old single young adult lady moved to Maryland from Virginia, exercising her independence, if I wanted, and by the way, Sarah, I never really looked, <laughs> I could have known at any point of the day where she was. There's some peace of mind in that. That's what a family does. A family looks out for each other. That's what we're trying to create in this congregation is a family atmosphere. That's why we fight sometimes, because we're family. That's why we get on each, ner each other's nerves sometimes, because we're family. But at the end of the day, family sticks up for family. Family looks out for family. And the bottom line, the best way to get a family atmosphere here 
is for everywhere you go home to, to have a godly family atmosphere, because that's what's going to happen when we come together. So, I feel like there was more I wanted to say on all that, but um, I'll move on. I don't remember, Angie, you can help me on this. I, I can't remember if Brother Hughes said this in a session or I feel like we were talking. We were, we were, I've, I've made it a point through the years when we've had different preachers come. I want to, especially if they have kids that are raised in church and stayed in church. I wanted, I wanted to add, what is your opinion? What is your perspective? What is, this, what is the secret or what are some of the things? And I've gotten a bunch of different answers. I've asked at least five or six men that I respect very highly. And this was a part of, at least, Brother James Hughes. Several years ago, Brother Hughes did a couple of our marriage seminars. Of course, we all, you know, a family that prays together stays together, and there is truth to that. But his answer was, that's not a typo. Some of you are thinking, boy, he really is jet-lagged. <laughs> no, that's intentional. A family that plays together, stays together. You know, and you, you, you're going to, I think in the video we'll show in a minute, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a part of that. I, I, I fully support, and please hear me, please hear this out. I fully support the need and the value and the benefit of, of family devotions, of family devotional time. I think it's very important. Can I tell you a little secret? This is one of those things, please don't use this as your excuse. I don't remember having family, regular family devotions growing up. I'm sure you probably thought the reason I'm here and I am who I am is because Bishop Wright had us up at 6 a.m. every morning, Bible with the bishop every day. And so I'll tell you another thing, and I really don't want to say this because you can use it and misuse it, but I'm just going to be honest with you. We, we, we never did regularly scheduled family devotions. I tried one time, one of my big regrets. I went, I got four three-ring binders. I printed a full-color front page for exploring God's Word, and we did one lesson. Because I think all of that is positive, and if you do it, please continue to do it. If you don't do it, please let, think about doing it. Pray about doing it. But I will tell you, I, I, I am of the opinion at the end of the day, when it comes to those closest to you, the way you're going to win each other is going to be less by your words and more by your actions. Peter says... He instructed wives, but I think the principle can apply. He says, you, if you got an unsaved husband, you're not gonna don't don't win him with your words. You you win him with your manner. And I believe in in the King James it says conversation. And you say, well, okay, talk. no, that word conversation is manner of life. It's conduct. It's actions. It's attitude. And I'm of the opinion, and I think if I did a survey and some research, I probably could prove this. I'm of the opinion there's a number of kids that grew up in church that are backslid today. They may have had family devotions on a regular basis, but there was a whole lot of actions that were contrary to everything that was being said. And as the old saying goes, actions speak louder and words. I'm, I'm going to probably mention something else about this in just a moment, but we, we were grabbing dinner out this evening, and it was right near a gas station. We were sitting outside, and I'm assuming it was a mom pulls up, nice SUV, uh, nice Mercedes SUV. I don't know what was going on, but her and her daughter, I presume, Going at each other, yelling and screaming, get back in the car, she told the daughter. I, I don't know what was going on, but I got to tell you, in a Christian home, there ought to be a difference. 
Whatever may be common or norm in the world should not be common and norm in the church. There ought to be a difference. And, and, and it's not something magical. It's not something mysterious. If you know anything about me, you know that this right here is something I love. This is a place I love. I love church. I love coming to church. I am, I got to be honest with you, I get more and more agitated with these apostolic people. Ah, oh, well, I'm not one of those people that like church, love church. What? Why not? There's a lot of things to not like. There's a lot of things to not love. Why are we not going to love this? Why are we not going to love the opportunity to come together with people of like precious faith? Why am I going to not love the opportunity to have a place to come where I am not bombarded with all kinds of garbage? You walk down the jetway to get on an airplane and you can't help but see pictures that are promoting alternative lifestyles. It's everywhere you go. We're not supposed to be some exclusive secluded group of people, but I love this place and I think you ought to love it. That being said, I preached about it on Father's Day last year. I think I could say my favorite place in the whole world is right there. I love all of you. I love being here. But my number one favorite place in the world is at my table. I had one of the neatest experiences of life two nights ago as we sat for the first time trying to figure out what are the holidays going to be like this year <laughs> with now two married couples in the family. And I'm sure most of you can't imagine this, but I just basically sit at the end of the table and listen, soak it all in. What an absolutely amazing moment because part of what I was hearing was, especially with the two married couples, they want to be around us. They're okay with being around. Now, sometimes, I don't know if that's because we're paying for dinner, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. I got to, I got to, I got to, can I challenge you parents? Because somehow my parents succeeded at this, and I feel like to a degree, at least somehow my wife and I succeeded. I, I don't buy into this deal that when your kids get teenagers and adults, that means they don't like you and they won't want to be around you anymore. I don't think that should have to be the accepted norm. The problem is if you want them to be around you as teenagers and adults, you got to start working on it when they're You can do a simple Google search on the, imp the importance of the family eating together and you will instantly find dozens of articles. Harvard and Stanford, two of the well-respected educational institutions of our world, of this country, pop up as some of the first few articles of the importance of families eating together. Despite family meal times being hugely beneficial to kids, only about 30% of families manage to eat together regularly. Part of me wants to not say it so direct. The other part of me wants to say it direct, so I'm going to say it the more direct. It ought to be the exception to your week to not have a, to have a day where your family, your household doesn't eat together a meal that day. It ought to be the exception, not the norm. 
Well, you don't understand our schedule. You don't under... Well, I guess I would beg to differ. Maybe I don't understand your priorities. And I know we've got so many families now that have to have two members, mom and dad, two people working because we live in a crazy area when it comes to the economy and, and inflation and all that. I get all of that. But there is great value. And I, I challenge you to do it if you go, go home and Google. Good old Google. The importance of sharing a family meal together regularly. When, when Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, was being honored by David as a, as, a, as a payback or a payment in a positive way to Jonathan, one of the things that he rewarded him with was, you are going to have a seat at my table. You're going to eat with me regularly. That's going, to be a, that's going to be your place. Some of the benefits of eating together. I've got it too small on here to read. but Some of the benefits for family dinners. Better academic performance. Higher self-esteem. Greater sense of resilience. Lower risk of substance abuse. Lower risk of teen pregnancy. Lower risk of depression. Lower likelihood of developing eating disorders. Lower rates of obesity. Better at cardiovascular health in teens. Bigger vocabulary in preschoolers. Healthier eating patterns in young adults. Multiple studies will tell you those are the benefits. Of so if you're sitting there going, brother, I just did some spiritual whatever. No. Is it a spirit? Sure. I mean, read through the Bible the number of times food and eating together and fellowship around food is mentioned. And even for adults, that's what the red says. Even for adults, better nutrition with more fruits and vegetables and less fast food. Less dieting, amen. Although I'm not sure about the less dieting part because, man, the more we eat together, the more I want to eat together. It's a proven fact that you sitting down together, spending time together has an impact, not just on your spirituality. I said earlier, we together was... Today was a little bit of a different dynamic because together, eating dinner together, today was Timothy and Nathaniel and I at a picnic table and Angie in the car because it was too cold for her to eat outside because we ate dinner at the, anybody had the, the taco truck at the Exxon by the mall? Whoo! Listen, if Taco Bell is your definition of Mexican food, dear Lord, you have not started living. We have time for what we want to have time for. Whatever our priorities are, that's what we make time for. And here's the part that might be as hard for you to swallow or some of you to swallow as the rest of it, the table should not look like this. <laughs> Anybody ever walk through a restaurant and notice? The number of plate tables where at least one, if not a few people, are heads down. I've watched two people that appear to be married or uh, a dating, and they're sitting there, both of them at the table, both heads down. And if you got a toddler and they don't know how to sit at the table an iP without an iPad, you're... I know, I know our kids were raised in the dark ages before there were iPads, so we don't have a clue, but that not that part of the point. They were raised without it, and it's very easy to let a device be the parent. Don't, don't forget we had four within six years. We know what chaos is like. We, we, we understand. 
<laughs> we understand. And God bless you if you share a meal at home together, but if you do that sitting around the TV, no. No, that, that, that's not quality bonding time. For the right, you have book, chapter, and verse. No, no, I sure don't. But I do know there's relationships and homes and families that are disconnected because they let things be a distraction. I, up until this house, I'm almost done. Up until this house we currently live in, from the time we bought our first townhouse and then the next two houses, we did not, and by my choice, we did not have a TV in the living room or the family room. How sad is it that so many of our houses now, a room is set up around one single focal point. The main room we use on a regular basis to gather in is all set up around a focal point. So from 1998, I think is when we moved in the townhouse, from 1998 until 2018, it was in the basement. Unfortunately, now, if it was in the basement, we'd all have to belly crawl in to watch it. All we have is a crawl space. So now it's in the family room. And can I tell you, I really am not thrilled about that. Because I don't want a piece of technology to be the thing that holds us together all the time. I want it to be the relationships and the connections that we have. I want it to be those things that bind us together, not some device. I came across this website today, and I want to share it with you. It is what it says on the plate. That's it. Thefamilydinnerproject.org. This is actually a non-religious website. But it's a website that's got recipes. It's got ideas and things to make your time together at the table more engaging, more exciting. It's got conversation starters. It's got other things like that. The world, non-religious, non-spiritual people recognize the value of people and families connecting. Some of my fondest memories, some of the memories that stand out the most happened at the table. I've told this one, I think I told it last year when we brought our table to church, but I think Timothy was just an infant. We were sitting at the table and eating, and I think Elizabeth was about four or five, and Esther was about two or three. I don't remember what Esther was doing, but she was doing something that she shouldn't be doing, but it was hilarious. And my wife and I were laughing when she did it. And after a few times, it was, stop, that's enough. And she'd do it again, and we'd laugh. So I finally said, I will spank you while I'm laughing. Stop. And I could go on and on, all just, just, just at the table. Again, I, I've tried to change. I really have. Nobody knows besides God how much I've tried to change or tried to convince myself to change because I'm rarely involved in the conversations that go on. Every now and then I'll chime in, but we got plenty of talkers in the house but I'm pretty sure it's known by now that my silence is not a disinterest or a boredom. I'm just soaking it all in. I want to challenge those of you with young families this evening. Not that I'm not challenging the rest of you, but those of you that really have time, I'm challenging you to make this a priority in your home may not be what you were raised with, may not be the norm, but I challenge you. It's a weird thing, and I know there's a lot of people here that can relate, and 
Some are farther along than my wife and I are. But it's a unique season as we embark on married kids now and begin to see that dynamic. But I think I could say for the both of us, one of the neat things is starting to see some of the fruit of what we've spent the last 20 plus years hoping and desiring to accomplish. And for the rest of you, that maybe you're in it already and you've already got some things that maybe you're in light of some things that have been said and taught, you're, you're not there, you're not doing it. I, I beg you to not, not just decide it's too late. But let the Lord help you, equip you, empower you to make some changes. You guys can cue that up. We're going to just share for the next, it's about 15, 20 minutes, I will tell you in advance, so you're not sitting there antsy. But as most of you know, a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> my wife and I, along with my parents, went to Columbus, Ohio, to attend Brother Cisco's funeral. Brother Cisco, who's been connected to this church in various ways since the late 70s. And it was, it was, uh, it was a very well-done funeral. It's the second longest funeral I've ever been in. Anybody know who the first longest was? Brother Whaley, four hours. Brother Cisco's funeral was about three and a half hours. And there was something very unique. In fact, I texted uh, Brother Cisco's son-in-law a couple of weeks or so, a week or two after the funeral, and just wanted to pay my compliments to them and the family for what a great job they did. I thought they did. And I referenced something, and he said it was, an, it was intentional. And that was this. They started out with speakers that were kind of officials, officials from the United Pentecostal Church and other ministers from around the nation that had interacted with Brother Cisco. They started there, and it, it went from there to more so close personal friends, Bishop Wright being one of those. And, and it all came down, lastly to his son, which will be the one here we're going to show. But I got to tell you, as I listen, and I'm, I'm, we're going to send out the link, and I would encourage you to go back at some point, because all of his grandkids spoke, and then his two daughters, his son-in-law, and his son spoke. And in light of what we've been teaching these last several weeks and finishing up here tonight, it was a very challenging, visible example of what all this can be. Hearing grandkids to kids talk about this man, who he was, what he was. And so I, I, I want to encourage you again at some point when you have time We'll send the link. We'll tell you at what point to go to start it so you don't have to watch the whole three and a half hours. But I feel like it was just such an amazing example of really everything we've tried to communicate these last several weeks. So, again, I know a lot of you know Brother Cisco. This is his son. He has two daughters, one son. And this is his son Jason's, a portion of what he said, his remarks that were specifically related to his dad. But what does it feel like to be the son of WLS? The son that's supposed to carry on his legacy, this towering giant of a man, this powerful force to be reckoned with. What's it feel like when you have that kind of passion? I remember reading this in, in his book and seeing the year when it was. I wasn't aware of it, obviously. I was too little, but my dad even offered me on the altar and said, God, to have revival, I'll give you my one and only son. When you hear your father say that about you, it has a deep, deep, feeling of 
sobriety to it. He was willing to put me on the altar. He was willing to put everything that was his future, that was his name, that would carry on his legacy. I'll give it all up if you'll just give us revival. And God, thankfully for me. So there's this video we want to show you, and <laughs> so there's this video we'll send you the link for. said, I don't need your only son, but you need my only son. You need mine. Now when I've got you speaking, God, if there's one thing that I want, if you would just let me see your glory. He was always hungry. We have heard this over and over and over again. But what does it feel like to be the son of WLS? The son that's supposed to carry on his legacy. This towering giant of a man. This powerful force to be reckoned with. What's it feel like when you have that kind of passion? I remember reading this in, in his book and seeing the year when it was. I wasn't aware of it, obviously. I was too little. But my dad even offered me on the altar and said, God, to have revival, I'll give you my one and only son. When you hear your father say that about you, it has a deep, deep feeling of sobriety to it. He was willing to put me on the altar. He was willing to put everything that was his future, that was his name, that would carry on his legacy. I'll give it all up if you'll just give us revival. And God, thankfully for me, <laughs> said, I don't need your only son, but you need my only son. You need mine. So how was I raised? Well, he raised me to be a preacher, of course. When I was, when I was two years old, he would set me up on the table, and I'd say, Pent, be baptized, every one of you, in Jesus' name. Receive the Holy Ghost. Da, 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 da. And he would laugh, and he would say, now let's do it again. He would paint me somewhere else, and we'd do it again. When I got old enough to be disciplined, which was like age four, he realized if I had a conscience and I knew what was right and wrong, that uh, it was time to hear the gospel. So he came in my room and he brought his big, it wasn't a little, it was this big Thompson Chain study Bible. And when you're four, it looked like the, the family, the King James family version Bible. And he opened it up. Son, I have to talk to you. Yes? You know, I'm like playing with a car or something. Son, if you have a conscience and you know right what from wrong and you know that you're a sinner and if you know that you're a sinner, I want you to tell. I have to tell you this is my responsibility as your father to tell you there's a hell. He told me about a hell that burned forever and ever and ever when I was four years old. And he told me, I'm sorry to tell you this, but if you don't obey the gospel, you're going to go to hell, son. And I don't want you to go to hell. So I'm going to tell you now what the gospel is. And he preached Acts 2.38 to me. He told me about repentance of my sins and the importance of baptism and receiving the Holy Ghost. And before that time, I didn't really have a whole lot of interest. But I was suddenly very motivated. <laughs> it wasn't very much longer. I was seeking for the Holy Ghost. You see, he started young with us. 
And all three of us got the Holy Ghost when we were five years old because that's the kind of father that we had. So I will just be brief on this one, but we had an evangelist at our house, and when I was seeking for the Holy Ghost, he was my favorite evangelist. He told stories, and he was staying in my room, so I figured it was okay if I talked to him. And we made a deal. If I wouldn't fall asleep, he would preach on Samson that night. I would always have that falling asleep part right halfway through the message, because I was five. And so I started falling asleep in the middle of the message, and, I, and he came down and looked at me like we made a promise, and I said, Oh, I better stay awake. So I was praying to stay awake in the middle of the service, and the Holy Ghost started to touch me. And all of a sudden, I started seeking for the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God said, if you will fall on the floor right now, you'll get the Holy Ghost. But I knew if I fell on the floor in the middle of the message, I might disrupt things, and Dad would not be happy about that. But then I thought, it's for the Lord, so it'll be okay. So I fell off my seat, bam. And when I did, the whole place just stopped. The preacher stopped, like, what on earth is going on? Well, my dad was not going to have any son of his disrupt the preacher while he was preaching. And the ground began to shake. As my dad's 12 Oxfords were coming down off the platform. And he was, uh, was going to take me out and apply the, the stick of instruction to the seat of learning. And when he grabbed my back and pulled me up, I was speaking in tongues. I was never so glad in all my life to have gotten the Holy Ghost. I appeased the wrath of both my heavenly father and my earthly father at the same time. But this was my dad. He was relentless. The next day, son, you got the Holy Ghost. That's good. Now let's talk about prayer. You got to learn how to pray every day. And if you'll wait at the end, God will speak to you. He's teaching a five-year-old to hear the voice of God. If you want to know why I am the way that I am, it's because my dad taught me to be this way. He wouldn't let me get baptized till I was six because he wanted to make sure I really had a conviction about it. And there were so many preachings about the rapture when I was growing up that I was so terrified. I finally went, Dad, please let me get baptized. All right, you're ready. He was always challenging us. We lived in a very spiritual home, and there was a lot of spiritual things that were happening, and some of these things were demonic, and I won't go into it. Jane talked about having dreams. I had bad dreams, too. I would wake up in the night many times when I was six, seven, eight, and we would go and just find Dad in the middle of the night, feel our way, and go in there, and Dad would always bring us out. We'd sit in the bathroom, and he would, he would okay. What are you feeling? What's going on? What happened? And I would tell him what I felt. All right, well, let's pray. And he'd pray for me. How you feel now? Okay. Think you can go back to sleep? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I knew he only had one eye. I mean, I, that was obvious. And he told us stories about it and used it as a, as a great object lesson for obedience because he lost his eye by being disobedient. So he explained, you know, that just one time of disobedience, he's living with it the rest of his life. And you don't know what may happen to you if you are disobedient. So obedience, you have to obey. So I, I, we, we heard those stories. But I didn't know what he did with his eye at night. And one of those nights, I had a really bad dream. And I was feeling my way into the room. And he had put it on a little napkin right by his bed. And I was already traumatized from this horrible feeling of a dream. And I was already scared. And I came over by his bed and I was like, ah! And I screamed out when I saw his eyeball there. And then my dad saw me wake up and he was like, what? And then he looked down at the eye and he saw me and he goes, uh, 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 uh. Scared of my eye, huh? I'll put my eye on you, he said. There are so many funny things that happened with his eye. I don't have time to tell you all of them. One of my favorite ones is when it fell out while he was working the aisles, uh, working the altar, and it rolled down to the altar like this. And a lady who had a big prairie dress on, and she was just kneeling down as the eye rolled. And he was trying to figure out how he was going to get the eye back. And he was standing there trying to... 
I can't, I can't, no, I can't do that. What am I going to do? So he stood there and just prayed while, while the lady was down there. And he didn't want anyone to know that his eye had fallen out and traumatized the rest of the people that didn't know he had a, had a prosthetic eye. Finally, she stood up and he quickly grabbed it and stuck it back in. That was one of my favorites. Dad was always, uh, he was always full of creativity. He was always uh, mixing it up. He was always going to see things from a different perspective. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that he overcame the adversity of losing his eye. So he, he had this sense. He had, he had been bullied as a kid because his eye was too big. He couldn't afford to get a new one every year. They had to get a too big of one for him. And so he would, his eye would be too big. And they say, here comes Billy, big guy. Here comes Billy, big guy. And so he was kind of shy and to himself. And then my very stern grandfather would always pull him back from everything because he didn't want him to lose his other eye. And so it took until he was about 10 years old before... Uh, he was able to overcome it. And I believe it was one of his uh, uncles that either introduced him to someone or had a false eye himself and told him to pop his eye out to use it as a trick. And he said, do you think that girl over there is cute? He said, yeah. He said, what? She makes my eye pop out. <laughs> and he said, you can do that. No other kid in school can do that. And so he went to school when he was like 10 years old and started popping his eye out. And man, he became the most popular kid in school. So he taught us that it was your perspective, it was your attitude, that if this is what happened to you, if you lose something, if you have adversity, you have to overcome it by seeing it from a different, change your attitude, your attitude determines your altitude. And this is what he always did. He always looked on the bright side and he was going to figure out how to overcome whatever adversity was there. Waking us up in the morning, creativity. You talk about creativity. So he would do this first. He would crank your eyelids open. I'm going to crank your eyelids open. Time to wake up. Well, if you didn't do that, it was time to go to the next level. So sometimes it was a drip of water, just a drip on your head. Just, and when you have a drip of cold water on your head, it, it wakes you up, I promise you. Sometimes he would come in with the dog, pull, the, pull everything back, throw the dog in the, in the bed and then cover it back over again and the dog would just go crazy, biting you and licking it. Oh boy, that was... But my favorite one was when he put the chair in the bed. He literally put a chair in my bed one time. And so as soon as I wiggle, the chair starts falling or it smacks you right in the head. <laughs> Should have got up when I told you to, you know. It was never a dull, dull moment. But my dad was teaching me early when I had those dreams. He would teach me the importance of understanding what a burden was. What's a burden? Well, first of all, he didn't want me to have to keep waking him up all the time. He wanted me to pray myself through. So he said, maybe you have a burden. Well, we had been on hospital visits. And every time we'd go on a hospital visit, he asked me, Put, put my hand where he put his hand and we would pray for these people. Sometimes we'd go to their house and pray for them. And every single one of them had gotten healed except one. And that was Sister Hoff. We'd go over to their house sometimes and we'd play Skittle there and then pray for Sister Hoff. And she would never get well. So one night he asked me if I had a burden. And I said, I think it's for Sister Hoff. And he said, okay, well, you go pray for her. And if you feel anything else or if you can't sleep, come back and tell me. And that's the beginning of my, my prayer life really started taking off uh, because I knew that dad was expecting me to pray for myself and not wake him up every time. So I prayed that night, oh God, if you're not going to heal her, then just take her. I want you to heal her, Lord. But if you're not going to heal her, just take her home. And the next week, she passed away. So that was the beginning of my healing ministry right there. <laughs> Oh, I got to tell you one more story, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish. I was very literal as a child. My dad, everything my dad told me was true. He told me to get the Holy Ghost to get the Holy Ghost. He told me God would speak to me, God would speak to me. Everything that he ever said was right. He was authority. I mean, he was the, he was the, the answer to everything. You go talk to dad. He was both my pastor and my dad. And every, every... Every definition of authority he had. 
So when the kids at church started talking about UFOs, I got to go talk to dad about this because I'm not sure what I think about this. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, people have been abducted and they've taken them away and all that. I said, oh, man, I don't know what to think. So I'm going to go talk to dad. Well, dad was funny, but he was also very serious. So when he was funny, you usually knew he was funny, but sometimes he was funny, but he wasn't telling you he was funny. This was one of those times. But me being the gullible child who had been disciplined and, you know, if he's sober and he tells me something, I mean, oh, I believe whatever you say. So I went in the room and I said, Dad, are UFOs real? And he just popped off that fat. Absolutely. He said, I've been on them. <laughs> the Bible says preach the gospel to every creature. He said, son, that word creature. He said, I preached the gospel to him. And I thought, wow. And I just walked out of the room. Man. So UFOs are real. And I started telling everybody, man, you know, my dad goes on UFOs and preaches the gospel. I said, you know, the Bible says creature there. There's, think about what that word says, that word creature. And I mean, I told, I don't know how many people, because I thought, you know, if anybody's going to preach the gospel to UFO, it would be my dad. God would choose. If anybody, it would be him. Well, he loved, he loved the police officers. He used to be a deputy sheriff. And we, he had won a couple to God, and they used to take him on these night shifts. He even had a police radio, and we could listen to it all the time. He'd call him, he'd hear something going on. Hey, what's going on? They'd come pick him up. So I started thinking, when does he go on the UFOs? Oh, I know. The police officer picks him up and takes him to a secure area. And then the thing comes. To, I had it all figured out. So I finally went into my dad's room. I said, Dad, I know when you go. I just want, I just want you to tell me the rest of it. And okay, you go like when they pick you up now at 11 o'clock last night. Did you go on a UFO last night? And he goes, UFO, me go on a UFO. And my sisters heard it. They heard it. And Julie had to translate. Jason, Dad was just joking. But I believed it because I believed everything that my dad said. So the context of, of my life was that my, my dad was my pastor. But he was, also, he was also a manly man. And he was noticing how skinny I was as a kid. And so he was getting a little bit concerned because we had guys like Rick and Jimbo and Scott that were all working out and these guys were all big. And here's this skinny little scrawny 12 year old boy that he has and I mean he could put 200 pounds over his head like nothing he was so strong and I, I love to fish so he told me he said son don't you want to get strong so you can pull in fish and I said well dad I got this amazing rod and that strong you know the the test we have 25 tests on that I can pull in anything and he was like I was thinking more like a weight set and so he got me a weight set and and uh, I, I went downstairs in the basement, and, and he said, how many weights are we going to pull on this bar? I said, how much does it weigh? He says, it weighs 20 pounds. I said, let's just stay with the bar, Dad. <laughs> I said, you're going to stand here and spot me? And my dad started laughing because I was asking him to spot me because while I was struggling to lift this weight, and he left the room to laugh at me. <laughs> but he didn't understand. It wasn't really his muscle that I was after. It was his mantle. I wanted to be strong like him, but that was not really what I was after. I wanted that mantle. I wanted that anointing. I would see my dad preach, and the anointing would be so powerful. His messages would be so powerful. I would say, I wish the whole world could have heard that message tonight, Dad. I wish everybody, that should have been at general conference. That was, that was incredible. The greatest prayer meeting that the world has ever heard. He preached that message. We had so many amazing messages on Sundays. He would, he would sometimes he would preach us into the floor and we would travail. There were the times he would preach us so high that we were running the aisles and dancing and jumping. And I would go after service. As soon as he was done, I would run up to him and I would, I would hug him while he was still sweaty because I wanted some of that anointing to just rub off on me. I just, and I'd say, I love you, Dad. I love you, Dad. I love you too, son. We'd get in the car, and I'd say, Dad, it was so awesome what you preached tonight. He said, what was my text? Oh, boy, whew, I didn't remember the text. <laughs> the next week, what was my text? This is what your text was. These were your main points. He taught me to remember. So as I heard about the miracles, and then I 
witnessed those miracles. And then as he was so close in my life, constantly there and giving me the tools that I needed, I felt, I felt that passion. I felt that passion. When he would preach the secret place, I would be there as a son saying, I'm going home with this guy, and I'm going to be in the car with him, and I would try to get him to talk to me more about it. I want to know about that. We would pray in the morning sometimes, and I would hear him say, oh, God, I just want to know you better. And I said, Dad, you've seen angels six times. You've raised the dead. You've preached all over the world. You're saying, I want to know you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm just barely getting to know the Lord. I, I don't know him just as much as I want to know him. And then I remember when the prophetic anointing would fall on him, and there were times, there were times when there would be a line in the church when we were growing up, and he'd prophesy over every single person in that line. And I'd watch it move on, and I thought, I'm going to find out about this. So I got in the line. I got in the line with everybody else, and he came up to me, and I raised my hands, and boy, thus saith the Lord, he prophesied over me. I'm like, wow, man, that was real. And I sat there on the front row, and I watched him go through, and I said, I think I'm going to go again. And so I got in the line a second time. And when I got to the second time, he looked at me and he felt he'd already prophesied over me. He looked at me and said, I already gave you a word. Go sit down. <laughs> but I wanted, I wanted the double portion. That's what I was after. The first prophetic word that I received was age 14. And they said that I would receive a double portion of my dad's ministry. That's what I wanted more than anything. He inspired us. But let me say this just to kind of wrap it up tonight. The greatest gift that he gave me, one of the greatest gifts he gave me, all the tools that I could possibly want. He gave me access to other great preachers. He exposed me to gifted people. He taught me about, uh, about ministry. He taught me about apostolic ministry. He gave me books to read. He prayed with me. He imparted to me. But in all of this, there is this feeling that he is this towering figure that I can never measure up to. When I was 15, Brother Cornwell called us and said, I'd like Jason to come and preach his first sermon here. And I was turning 16 that next week. It would have been uh, when we were going to be there. It was uh, in August that we would go. And this was somewhere, I think, April or May. And we were talking about going there. He was going to preach Sunday, and I was going to do Monday and Tuesday for the young people. That was going to be my first revival, and I was going to preach it with my dad. And my dad looked at me, and he said, Son, you and I can make a deal. He said, We're father and son. He said, I went beyond my dad. My dad was a Nazarene uh, preacher. He was a really good man. He started four churches. He worked very hard. He said, but I've, I've gone beyond him. I've gone beyond him in truth, and God has carried me places my dad never went. And he said, son, you've got to go beyond me. He said, I want you to go beyond me. And he said, you and I can make this, make this pact that your son after you will go beyond you and his son after him, and so on. He gave me permission to see beyond him. He gave me permission to go beyond. He expected me to go beyond. He sat with me one time. We traveled to go in camp meetings when, he was, when I was 17. We went to three different camp meetings. In one of those conversations in, in the hotel, he says, just you and me, sons, just you and me. Dream, dream with me. Dream big. Tell me, what, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do? And I thought, you know, I, I knew he loved Brother Urshan so much, and I thought that would be the answer to please him, you know, would be to, to aspire to something great. And I said, I'm going to be general superintendent. And he said, son, I said, dream. He said, that would be a nightmare. He said, I thought, son, that you would say stadiums full of people needing the Holy Ghost. I thought that you would say that there would be thousands that would be healed and thousands that would receive a miracle. I thought you would say something like that, not that you wanted to be a general superintendent. And I realized as much as he revered the organization, as much as he revered Brother Urshan, it was worldwide revival that was his passion. And that's what he put in all of us. So before I was 25, I preached general conference, and I preached to 100,000 people. And he wrote me a little card, and he said, you've done more than I did before I was 25. He 
said, I've never preached to 100,000 people. He said, all right, what next? He was challenging me. If it wasn't for what he put in me, I wouldn't have been anywhere close to the ministry that I have today. He gave me the foundation, and I honor him for that today. But I feel this in my spirit right now. What next? What next? He inspired us. You can what next? cut it. There's a term that I think has become fairly common, and we heard it throughout 2020. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a TV show named with the same thing, and that's the new normal, the new norm. I wonder if all of us here this evening and those of you that in the future are watching this as a part of your grow discipleship process, I wonder if we could make a, a pact together that the new normal out there does not become the new normal in here. And just because the world may become used to broken homes, broken families, broken relationships, that does not mean we have to accept that as being the norm in here. I want you to stand. For the sake of time, I'll just do it this way rather than asking for a bunch of moving around. So whether you're with or by your family or not, would you just reach over to somebody right now, grab a hand, put a hand on a shoulder. Could we just join together in whatever, again, the circumstances are for each one of us. We're older and lived a lot of life. Or those of you that are young and a lot of life ahead of you. Whatever, whatever the dynamics are that we want them to be everything God wants them to be. God, I pray tonight for every home, every family that's a part of this congregation. God, I pray for every family in the future that will become connected to this congregation. I pray, God, that you would strengthen, reinforce, uplift, encourage. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, God, that there would be healing, wholeness, restoration that would come in our lives. That, God, what you want us, want us to be, what you want our homes, our families to be, that that would become the reality, Lord. Lord, in a world of so much brokenness, in a world of so much dysfunction, don't let it be the norm, God, that in the, in the church, in your body, that's, that's what we're used to. Strengthen every husband, strengthen every wife, strengthen every mother, strengthen every father, strengthen every grandmother, strengthen every grandfather, strengthen every child, strengthen every brother, strengthen every sister, strengthen every aunt, every uncle, cousins, nieces, nephews. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, heal us from the hurts and the wounds of our past so that our future can become everything you want it to be, God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of your Spirit. In the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray that this congregation would be, would always be, an example, a reflection of what a family is, God. Lord, that that would be the kind of bond and connection that we share with each other. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm sure, there's a lot of different things that I could say as the final words of this series. 
but hopefully I guess this comes from my pastor's heart. And that is that this would be a place for all of those who come from broken homes and broken families and dysfunctional backgrounds, that this would be a place that they find what they didn't have before. I've watched my four kids view people in this congregation as just as much their family as biological family. There are people in this congregation that my kids call aunt and uncle that it's not just a cute term of endearment. They've truly been that. I watch people that have also been like grandparents to them. And folks, the bottom line is the time we have between now and which Jesus comes, we're only going to be dealing with people coming from more and more and more broken, dysfunctional lives. And what a place to be able to find what they've been missing. God bless you. I'm not looking for a response to this, so please don't respond. I mean it just sincerely, and I think I can speak with my, for my wife as well. It is our hope and prayer that for those of you present and those of you that may be watching in the future, that this series has been and will be a blessing and a benefit to your lives. In Jesus' name, amen.